I'm uh, Michael, this is Gil, and if you're observant, you notice there's three names up there and not just two. Uh, unfortunate Reed Reynold, our co-presenter for personal issues at the last minute, was unable to arrive, so we're going to try to cover his material as well. Um, we're going to go over the perfect match, Apache Sparks meets OpenStack Swift. Um, so, what we're going to cover is a very, very quick overview of OpenStack Swift, a quick overview of Apache Spark, and then Gil is going to talk about how to integrate Apache uh, Spark with OpenStack Swift. We'll show a demo of using Apache Spark on a public Swift object store. We'll then talk about some considerations if you know, someone wants to go and deploy it themselves in terms of how to organize the cluster. Uh, Swift obviously runs on a cluster. Apache Spark also runs on a cluster. And we'll then show some advanced stuff we've been experimenting with, showing how we can pull Swift and uh, Spark together in a uh, differentiated uh, a, 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 and you know, perhaps a more efficient way. So let me start with you know, just getting a sense of what people know. Um, how many people here have used uh, OpenStack Swift? OK. And how many people uh, are familiar with Apache Spark? OK. All right, so Swift, an OpenStack project, is a massively scalable object store. It's not a file system. It's not a database. It stores objects. It stores blobs. It's good for storing things like images or videos, logs, JSON documents, basically things, right? And it's you know, good for hybrid clouds because there's a bunch of public cloud providers that support it. And it's something you can go and deploy in your own data center. Um, it's massively scalable. It's software-defined storage. Right? The, basically, you download the code for Swift, deploy it on a set of servers, and you have an object store. It exports a RESTful API, meaning that you access it through HTTP requests. You can do a put to create an object, to get, to retrieve an object. Um, a little bit about the layout of Swift. It is basically a two-tiered architecture. The externally facing tier, uh, the one that the client interacts with is the proxy tier. The proxy tier is responsible for getting the requests and then redirecting the request to a node in the storage tier for actually serving the requests. Um, you know, at a level of, you know, next level of detail, Swift has accounts, in accounts are containers, and in containers are objects, and there are different types of storage nodes for accounts, containers, and objects. Um, and in, you know, so far, the way Swift protects data is it replicates the data um, such that when you go and you create an object, you're going to get some number of replicas of those objects created on a subset of the storage nodes such that each storage node is in a different failure domain. Um, you know, a little footnote, uh, those some of you may have heard, yesterday there was a talk about erasure coding, uh, which is something that's expected to be coming up in the Kilo release for Swift. Into a little more detail about Apache Spark. I assume everyone here is familiar with Hadoop, MapReduce. Well, you can think of Apache Spark as maybe the next generation uh, MapReduce type calculation. It's the fastest growing um, big data project in Apache. Um, it is capable of operating for workloads that fit in memory, you know, two orders of magnitude faster than Hadoop map reduce. Uh, for things that go to disk, it's an order of magnitude faster. Um, one of the key innovations for uh, Spark, and this was a project built on a project that started at UC uh, Berkeley, is what's called RDDs, right, or resilient distributed data sets. Now, the way something like um, Hadoop works is that it's, you know, each time a map task or reduce task produces output, reduce, you know, its calculation, it writes it down to a disk. This persistent copy of the data is used for communication between the various stages of the computation. It's also used to protect the computation. In RDDs, everything is kept in memory, 
And to deal with recovery, they keep track of the lineage, how something was computed. And in the event of a failure, failures, you know, while they happen, right, uh, maybe more than we'd like to think, are still relatively rare, they'll redo the computation um, based on that lineage, based on the history of how that data was uh, created. Um, you know, Spark is mostly written in a language called Scala. When you see the demos in a little bit, you'll see some use of Scala. Uh, don't need to be a Scala expert, though, to understand what we'll be showing. And uh, one of the key companies involved in, uh, in Spark is a company called Databricks, Reynolds' uh, company. Um, it was founded in 2013. It is the uh, largest contributor to Spark. They also have um, a cloud service for accessing Spark called the, the, the Databricks Cloud. Um, Spark, as I said, is uh, the most active big data project. You can see it has very quick growth in terms of uh, number of contributors. This is actually reminiscent of what used to be, you know, you know what we saw for, for OpenStack in its early days. Um, it has a uh, single engine which can handle many different types of big data workloads and it scales you know, from gigabytes up to terabytes and petabytes of data. Um, now, as I said, you know, Spark handles a bunch of different types of workloads. Uh, there's the Spark core engine, which does the processing of the data. And on top of that, there are a set of different types of interfaces for giving different ways of interacting with the data. So, for instance, there's something called GraphX, which is for graph computation, sort of understanding network interconnections. That's not quite, you know, production level <laughs> code. Uh, there's streaming to deal with streaming applications. And the one we'll be seeing is um, uh, Spark SQL, which enables putting an SQL-like interface, enabling doing queries like select over data. So what we want to go on to now, and I'll, Gil will take over, is um, how we integrate Spark with various data sources, going deeper into that, and then a discussion of how we do it with Swift, and uh, Gil. Okay, so Spark can work with the many data sources. It's where the data located in Spark use this data source to make analytics. Originally, it works with local file system, HDFS, Amazon S3, or Cassandra and uh, Mongo and so on. Uh, the good thing that you can integrate, you, you can configure Spark to work with many data sources at once. So you can integrate in the same query, you can access many data sources and pull data from those data sources to perform analytics. You can achieve this in a variety of ways. So first of all, you have shell in Spark. You can use Python shell or Scala shell. It allows you to use interactive uh, way of uh, analytics, or you can uh, write your code in uh, Python, Java, Scala, and deploy it uh, to Spark to perform analytics. And the results of the analytics, it's up to you to decide what you want to do with them. So you can store them back in the data source, in the same data source that the source came from, or you can store it in another data source. You can uh, print them, you can see them, We'll see it in the demo, what we can do with them. So what we actually did, we, we took the Spark and allowed it to integrate with Swift. And uh, the good thing here is that you don't really need to modify the code of Swift. So Swift is completely unaware that Spark uh, uses uh, data there. And Spark itself, you don't need to modify code in Spark. What you do need to do is to configure. You just use a certain configuration in Spark. You configure it to use Swift as a data source. Then you build Spark the same way as you build it in any case. And then you use it. Uh, we, we submitted it back to the community in Spark. It was merged in the 1.10 version. And you can see it on their website, uh, how to integrate Spark with Swift. The usage, uh, I'm not going here into details, but uh, I just use the schema, Swift. And then you can access your container uh, or particular object in Swift. And here we access, uh, again, I'll explain it in the demo. Here we access container logs data in the soft layer. And we access all the objects in this container. 
So a bit on this configuration. So basically, you need we are using a dual driver of Swift. So the configuration is you just need to configure the Swift driver as a source data definition. And then it's up to you to decide what the authentication you want to use. So here it's an example of two of them, V1 and V2 authentication with Keystone. And of course, there are many other parameters that you need to configure to make it work. OK, so Spark allows you to use actually a couple of ways that you can integrate with the data source. The, the, the first one, so what you see here is the Scala shell. And I'm, I'm access here the container with name Insights in software, all the objects. This is the definition of the data source that you see in the SF311. And then when I declare the data source, I can use Spark as I normally use. Here I just count all the lines in these text files. So in the container, uh, there are objects. Each object is a text file. And what we see here is the Spark, uh, uh, first of all, very sw swift to, un to understand how many objects there are in this container. And then it just count all the number of rows. So this is part of the configuration. So we see here that we define software, and it actually access the object store there. And we provide additional configuration. In particular, you see here API key and username. You don't have to store it in this configuration file. I mean, it's only for the demo purposes, but you can also provide this in runtime, as you normally do in Spark. Spark SQL, it's another way to access data. So the idea that you can use SQL uh, syntax to access data inside those objects. Still, Spark communicates with an object, but it can also understand what's inside those objects. And then you can write your regular SQL, and you access those objects. So what we see here, <coughs> a standard SQL with select and from and group by and uh, Again, we will see it a little bit later. This is what was before called Shark. Now it's called Spark SQL. And you can, in, you can access here many data sources in the same query, which is also a very nice feature. Let's see the demo. This is the recorded demo that I did before. But uh, those who are interested can come to me after the talk. I can see them live, how it works. And. Uh, OK, I'll just stop it. So but what I did, I wanted to took some public data sets to show you the taste of this analytics, of this integration. And there is a public data sets of the 311 service in the United States. We took one of San Francisco. You access there, and you see all the records, all the incidents that occurred in the city. It's all public there. And the good thing that you can download them to in any format that you like. So what I did, I just entered this public data set, and I saved uh, records of two years, I think, in two CSV files. And those files I upload to software, to the object store. So this is what you see here. This is how the data set looks like. And now I just show you in the REST client that there are two objects inside container inside. They're both CSV files. You can see the content of one of the files. Um, just a CSV file with this delimiter that I used. And now I'm going to show you what you can do in Spark. So as I mentioned before, there are a couple of ways you can uh, analyze your data. This is a demonstration how I write application. Then I deploy it as a JAR file and I submit it to Spark. Uh, later, I will show you how you can use the interactive uh, shell. So there are a couple of things here that you need to see. That The first one, we define uh, the Swift where we want to access. It's container inside. We want to access all the objects. We map. We know what is the information there. It's CSV files. We map it to a table 
And this is uh, we call uh, we see our <laughs> the table incident. And then we map only particular fields from the each record. And now we can use standard SQL to analyze it. So this is the data source. And uh, we use a scan that actually what we want to do here is to get all the neighborhoods and sort them by open records. So after you write this application, you compile it with SBT. You can also use Maven. It generates a JAR file. And now you just submit it to Spark. And you have your uh, results on the screen. All the neighborhoods sorted by open records in this data set. And now you can use any other tool to visualize it or to build graphs or to continue analytics, if you like. OK, so we're back to the, to the. A few words about cluster management in Spark. <laughs> so there are a variety of ways you can use it. The, the, the simple one, you can use standalone cluster. It's very easy to set up this cluster. You just run a couple of scripts, and you have it automatically. You can use all kinds of other frameworks. Uh, to, to, to build your cluster. There is also support in Sahara from uh, in the recent uh, release that allows to run uh, elastic data processing jobs of Sahara in spi inside Spark. A bit about cluster management, a, a bit about cluster. So, so actually what we, we have, we have Swift as a data storage. And we have Spark, which is an analytic cluster. So we can integrate those clusters in a variety of ways. Um, one way to, to, to do this, th they can share the same resources. Maybe you install Spark on the same cluster of Swift. Maybe they share only certain uh, resources, certain machines. It, it allows you actually to, to have some data locality. So Spark will uh, be close to the data in Swift. But on the other hand, it's costly. And it actually requires Swift to share the same, the same resources with Spark, which is not a good approach. So what you can do, you can install them on separate clusters. And now you can manage those clusters separately. This is more standard approach. So you have your storage. And you have your analytic cluster. And Spark can access Swift, as we saw before, via REST API. The, the problem here that that sometimes it's not efficient, because you use a lot of network. In particular, Spark may need only certain data sets for its analytic, and not the all body stored in Swift. So sometimes you transfer a lot of information over the network that's not really needed by Spark. There are also certain security considerations here. For example, you may have some sensitive data in Swift that you can't move to the analytics, so you need to somehow filter it before you move it to the analytics. Um, so let's uh, see some use cases where uh, we actually need less information for analytics than we have in the object store. So we may have images in Swift. It, it's very good to, to, to keep them. But on the other hand, we may want to analyze only XF metadata. Those who are familiar with it, XF metadata has a lot of information about, uh, about image. It has information about the uh, camera that was used. And if the customer or user has also enabled GPS coordinates, then you can also extract this from Exif metadata and know a lot of information. The same analogy can be with PDF files. You may want to analyze metadata or some partial text of it. And logs, it's another example. So you may, you may want to, to store your log files in Swift as an object. As an archive, you just put them, and it's good. But uh, when you perform analytics, 
may only interested in the record that marked with error. So this is what you want. And then, uh, assuming that you don't have a lot of errors in the log files, then it's only a small subset of the data. The problem here is that when you use the standard approach and you move all this, info, all this uh, data source from Swift to Spark, and then you use a lot of network, and it's costly and slow. So the question here, can we move a little bit less data over the network? With respect to SQL, there is some analogy that it, it's, it's a little bit easier to push a SQL query inside the data source. So basically, you can take this where log status like error and move it inside database. And then database will uh, somehow run this and will return only the subset of records to Spark that will be later used by to analyze information. There is some work in the community on this. And uh, you can read on this uh, on various websites. Also, Cassandra has information how to push queries down. And what about Swift? Can we do the same? So, Storlets is a IBM solution that we can, we can run user code inside Swift. Uh, the idea here that user can uh, write a standard application, it can be standard Java library, you can use any library dependencies that you want. It's a standard application, you export this as a jar file, and then you deploy it to Swift. Uh, from Swift point of view, the jar stored it itself, and the dependencies just uh, normal objects. So Swift stored them as it usually store objects. But the magic comes from the Storlet engine inside Swift. And the Storlet engine knows when Storlet is triggered, knows how to deploy the Storlet to the storage node what that contains the data, and then it knows how to activate it in a secure uh, way that uh, there will be no harm. Um. So we can uh, there will be later a talk that you see here about Storlet that you can attend. So the idea here that Storlets now can help us to achieve better network utilization when we want analytics. Be because Swift is good, cheap data object store that you can put your data. Spark is good with analytics. Now you can use Storlets to effectively take the data, what is actually needed for analytics, and move it to the analytics to Spark. And the example that I show you is the EXIF metadata that I said before. So all those images, they have a lot of EXIF metadata. And uh, an example here, so the, the you can take a lot of packages and just go to Apache Commons, I think, and you take a package that extracts metadata, EXIF metadata from an image. It's actually a few lines of code in Java. So you can take, and the, the image can be, the, this particular image is about 10 megabytes, I think, size. The EXIF metadata is about uh, one kilobyte size. So you can write very simple application in Java using uh, some open source package that extracts this metadata from image. And now we will see how this works. We're going to video, the second one. So, so I, I have images in my Swift. And there are 314 images. These images are taken from my camera, and I just upload them to Swift. We can see here that the, let's see how this image looks like. So you will see it's a lot of pixels there. It's a large image. And uh, so now what we do, we, we want, I deploy, I wrote this storlet, this code that knows how to extract access metadata from image, and the storlet returning back as a request, as a response. So you need to trigger this storlet, and uh, the trigger is actually here. There are a couple of ways you can trigger it. One way is to add something to the container that will trigger the storlet. From this moment, when it will arrive to Swift, 
Storlet engine will understand that there is need to activate Storlet. It will get to the node, storage node, where the data actually located, this particular image. It will activate the Storlet and return back JSON file. And why we want JSON file? Because this is how Spark knows to work with it efficiently. And now we can have better network utilization because we transfer much less data on the network. So we enter Spark shell, and we're going to use SQL to analyze this EXIF metadata. So we define here the data source. And when we define this data source, we also has this trigger for a storelet. So the storelet engine will understand inside Swift that storelet needs to be activated. Uh, from this point, we use standard uh, Spark. I mean, we just define a data set. This is a new feature in Spark that actually allows you to map JSON to table, because JSON already contains schema. You have uh, key value, key value, so they just use key to generate table for you. And this is print schema. You see the text in Spark, understand what is this JSON about, and created a schema for me. And now I'm using standard SQL, and I'm going to, to understand, to count all those ISO ratings that my camera used. But you can, of course, use here uh, whatever you like, and I want to count all those ISO ratings of my camera. And you see this is standard SQL with all the regular syntax. And now we have the result. So this is the result. We see here that uh, ISO 800 was 106 times, and this one. So we just take, I just took this information with the copy paste to Excel, or I could store it as a text file and automatically load it in Excel, whatever you prefer. And I put it in Excel and created a graph that visualizes this ISO analytics. And the good thing that we transferred that we can have now a very small cluster of Spark because we don't need to transfer all those images in Spark and anali analyze them in Spark. We just transfer JSON files. Yep. And this is the summary. So Swift is great. It's a cheap, good, reliable object store. You can put your data and be confident that it's safe there. Spark is great to do analytics. And you can integrate them in a simple way and do analytics in Spark. You can also use advanced features and transfer much less data over the network. And again, do the same analytics in Spark. Hi, uh, I work on Sahara. Um, so my question for um, Spark and Swift integration in 1.1.0, is that being supported through the uh, Hadoop OpenStack jar, or is there another mechanism? The, the, the integration itself is through Hadoop OpenStack jar, exactly. Okay. Thank you. You just integrate, just compile it, and that's it. So, so, um, one of the issues we're looking at uh, in the next version of Sahara is um, uh, dealing with authentication for Swift and how to get that into the Hadoop configuration uh, under the covers. Um, do you have any? So, so what you saw before, I just put those credentials inside the configuration and then Spark used this. You, you can provide them in runtime, the same way Spark access uh, Amazon S3, you just need to provide those uh, credentials for S3 to Spark. Exactly the same way you can provide them for Swift. I have an example 
a simple Java application that you just provides your credentials in runtime, and you don't need to store them in some configuration file or I mean, you can, but uh, if you want to provide in runtime, you can also do it. Okay, thanks. I'm just wondering, um, these storelets, can be part of a Spark script that we push to Swift, or they should be there in Swift already and the Spark just points to them? We've already done so far in Spark and in Spark Swift, they are already uh, in Swift. Uh, we saw it in Swift work successfully working on fast about uh, too fast to store. Sorry, uh, another storelet question. Um, so in the example that you have, are your storelets running in the object server or they're running uh, object server or Swift or they're running separately elsewhere and accessing so this the Swift API? So the storelets are not running. The storelets are objects inside Swift. No, but you're asking when they do the access extraction. When they do access extraction, they, they do it on the fly. So you access Swift in regular API and we just have this trigger in the container name. You can also trigger it via a header. But and, and then the storage engine understands this, and it, it activates storage on the storage node. It's in streaming. So it just stream whatever it needs, and that's it. So, th so the access from storage to Swift goes through the proxy server? No, 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 no. It's already on the... On the oh. But the access... Thank you. Just to, to follow up on that question. So, um, so are, are the storelets stored uh, on the same no object uh, server node as the data that you're trying to compute? Uh, and do they run from that object server? Uh, or, 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 or is data transferred from, I was just trying to understand because you t was talk about data locality. And and the data is also going to be transferred. Um, I think you mentioned in your slide that there's a detailed talk later on on Stolet. Could you expand on that? Podcast of Spark 
Thank you, everyone. Thank you.